Hello, good morning, and welcome to the Blockade Runner podcast, Power of the 90s, uh, number two, I think, covering 1992. Our Power of the 90s series is all about looking at everything Star Wars uh, in the 90s, and we're going year by year, so this year is 1992. There is some seriously cool stuff to talk about from 1992, lots of really fun stuff, and with me to do that early this morning on a breakfast with the Blockade Runner episode is uh ryan hi uh welcome aboard the zorba express <laughs> yeah absolutely the zorba express uh like i said it's we're super excited we've been texting and messaging back and forth all month about like some of the great stuff that's part of uh star wars in 1992 so uh very excited to talk about those things um but it is really early in the morning ryan um so it's i had to I said, well okay yeah, I'd see it's actually even earlier for you than it is for me, time zones. But uh, because it's breakfast time, we'll say, I needed to get some Star Wars uh, sustenance um, for me mm. to, to keep me going during this podcast. Um, so I just want to show that off here because uh, I'm excited about it. So I have my, um, I don't know if I've ever showed this off on the show. I probably have my Coffee Keeps Me Rolling uh, BB-8 coffee mug, which I love to uh, drink my calf out of each morning. Mm. <laughs> so uh, do a little bit of calf there and uh, of course I made that in my uh, French press which um, my my calf press which uh, my wife actually about 10 years ago or something bought me this uh, clone trooper koozie like warmer thing to keep your French press warm um, so you know I got that going um, but I didn't know if a, a cup of calf would be enough um, so I also went to, ha went ahead and, and grabbed some blue milk, um, for my morning podcasting here. Does, does blue milk have caffeine? I don't think blue milk has caffeine. No, but it's got nutrients and stuff. Oh, okay. You need, you, yeah, it can't be all caffeine all the time. I mean, I go, I go pretty hard on the calf, but sometimes you need, you know, other, other nutrients and things like that. So this is some blue milk. I haven't tried it yet. I wanted to try it live on the show. Okay. So my first, uh, my first sip of the blue milk. If you're not watching the video, you're missing out here. Yeah. Uh, let's give um, I can confirm the milk is blue. It's, <laughs> in, a, it's in a tumbler here. Uh, yep. He's drinking it. You know what? Tastes really good. What? It tastes exactly like unsweetened vanilla almond milk. Uh, with oh, maybe interesting. two drops Just of blue food coloring. Food coloring. Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> but it's really good. It's very good. Mm hmm Nice almond milk is great. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure blue almond milk is even better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Uh, drinking uh, and swallowing sounds are always perfect for podcasting. So you're welcome for that. Almost as good as chewing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then my last thing here, I did, this was a surprise. My wife just brought this in for me. This is my uh, Zorba's slime smoothie. That's what Zorba slime Zorba slime smoothie here. Mm-hmm. Zorba slug, slug smoothie, yeah. Zorba. Maybe Zorba, Zorba slug. slimy slug. Slimy yeah. slug, yeah. Anyway. I don't know. Yeah. Speaking of Zorba, we need to strap into this uh, Zorba Express. Yeah, the Zorba Express. You're going to be leading that train, um, it's, I it's, think. It's taking off, yeah. Yeah, taking off. So yeah. we'll stop talking about my, uh, my snacks here, my morning snacks, and we'll get into uh, all the cool stuff that came out in 1992 for Star Wars. And we're going to start with books. Um, cool. So... You're going to, yeah, you're definitely going to be kind of the lead man here, Ryan, because uh, there's a number of these books I unfortunately have not yet read, uh, starting with the, the, probably the most popular, the biggest, uh, most important book from 1992, uh, Dark Force Rising, which is the second in the Timothy Zahn Heir to the Empire trilogy. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking that you have read that, but it's been a while. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Okay. Any strong memories of this one or, or thoughts on Dark Horse Rising? No, I mean, I think with the trilogy, I, I feel like they're, uh, they're very consistent throughout. Like, I don't really have, like, a favorite or anything. Um, you know, it, I do kind of think of it as one um, continuous story. Um, I have not, again, I have not read this 
in years. Um, so I don't actually remember what exactly went down in this book compared to the others. Um, I mean, I know the general story arc, but I still feel like that is probably a conversation for like a reread and another cast to, uh, you know, kind of talk through all of these books. Um, but I did kind of relate it. I did finish Thrawn this week. Um, the like new canon novel so um i've kind of been in the in the thrawn zone but uh not not with this particular book but you know the, sure. it's a it's a it's a classic it's a you know legend uh no no pun intended um but yeah i just didn't have time to revisit this the series for these episodes sure sure yeah and i mean the thing with I would love to do uh, an episode about this trilogy at some point down the line. Um, although it's a it's a busy couple months here coming up, so we'll see mm -hmm. when, when we when we make that happen. But uh, but yeah, eventually I'd love to do that. But then again, at the same time, it's it's one of those things where it's like it's probably I would think it has to be the most talked about Star Wars novel or like you know couple Star Wars novels um, ever. You know what I mean? Um, they're just so huge and so. And they were so impactful and such a big part of getting mm -hmm. Star Wars going again in the 90s, which we talked about quite a bit on on our last uh, Power of the 90s show for 1990 and 1991. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I would love to do that at some point, and I hope we do. But uh, I, I feel okay in not talking too much about Dark Force Rising here tonight because it's a conversation that a lot of other people have had many times. And we're going to move on to talking about another book. And I have a feeling that this is probably one of the least talked about books or series of books <laughs> in Star Wars podcasting. So maybe it's a good idea to spend more time on uh, these these upcoming books. Um, so maybe we can, uh, in unison here, Ryan, like just like hold them up together. You know what I mean? Like kind of Captain Planet style here. Uh, okay. or, or I'll just do it. I could just do it myself because you're not holding your book up. But uh, <laughs> okay, well, um, yeah, I got one of those too. <laughs> yeah, and yours is better because it's like got the notes sticking out the side of it. Because uh, oh yeah, you've got some big time some notes. annotations here. Yeah. Now yours looks like you have the. Uh, by the way, this the the book we're holding here is uh, the Glove of Darth Vader, the Lost City of the Jedi, and Zorba the Hutt's Revenge from Paul Davids and Hollis Davids. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the first of these books are actually, I think all three of these were published in 1992. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's when these came out. But I think you are, it looks like you have the uh, Barnes and Noble uh, books edition, the hardcover collection. Yeah, um, I actually do have the individual like floppy trades, um, the paperbacks of mm -hmm. all of these, but they are um, in a box in... Illinois somewhere uh, oh, okay. with a lot of my Star Wars books and stuff. So I just needed something to reread re them for the podcast. But this uh, this Barnes and Noble edition on Amazon you can get for like five bucks shipped, and it has three books in it. So yeah, yeah, I think I paid maybe ten for it shipped, but uh, either way, it's well worth it. Um, and it's a good, yeah, like it's a good hardcover edition. It's got a very nice, like, like on the back here, it's got this nice, I don't know the name of this font, but this is a very like late, mid, mid nineties, late nineties Star Wars font, you know? Yeah. Um, which I, I like. So it's just got a cool look if you're into the Star Wars nineties era and it safe to say we are. So it's cool in that regard. Um, um, also the cover, uh, Drew Struzan. Yes. Yeah. 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 I was just looking at this this morning and, uh, uh, scoping out Trioculus here, who <laughs> on the cover <laughs> looks so like it looks just straight out of a movie almost, you know what I mean? Or at least straight yeah. out of like the normal Legends covers and stuff. Drew Struzan did many of those, but uh, yeah, it, he's got a m much more um, cartoony look inside the book, which is also oh, yeah, because and then cool. the interior art is by Carl Kessel, who's a like long time uh, superhero comics artists like i've um i've read a lot of superhero comics that he's done the art for lots of uh dc stuff superman stuff like that so um his uh the interior art is very cartoony but it's got like a nice like thick um like line style that's like really uh i think probably 
very appropriate for this sort of young adult style book. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's amazing. I, I really love the art inside and uh, comic, you know, like the comic influence is what I probably should have mentioned mm-hmm. rather than the cart. It's not cartoony. It's, it looks like a comic. Sure. In fact, we've got a great uh, drawing of Trioculus here with, I believe, oh, uh, Grand Moff Hisa. Um, yeah. And uh, it almost, you know, like I can imagine like a, it looks almost just like those, you know, classic drawings you see of the Joker, you know, smiling like that with the fist in the air. And yeah. Everything. So, um, really, really cool in that regard, I think. Yeah. And I think, um, so <laughs> these books are pretty silly. Um, mm. <laughs> like we'll just get that out of the way. They were intended, um, almost, they almost feel like running in parallel to the Zahn trilogy because they are kind of like a post return of the Jedi story. And I'm sure if, like, I'm sure you can plug these into the timeline somewhere, but like, man, that is going to be some messy stuff. Like even in 1992, I'm like, wait, if, you know, heir to the empire is happening right now, how are they also? <laughs> um, and that's, yeah. I think that's kind of, you know, one of the issues that would only be exasperated throughout the eu with just so much like overlap and um and then trying to fit everything into the timeline and you know everything works and it just kind of doesn't but you know that stuff it's neither here nor there well let me just add real quickly uh i totally agree um and it's just an interesting thing because right now the it's it's awesome the way that the story group and lucas uh film and lucas books views the children's books as totally canon for the most part Mm -hmm. and you know like we can run out on force friday and get a book that's written for like a middle grade you know elementary school audience and like be excited to read it because it's going to tie into the films and like we'll learn more about characters from Mm -hmm. the films um and it expands our understanding of it and like a lot of times like with the the journey to the force awakens my favorite books were actually ones written for children in a lot of ways and those are the ones that um, you know, they're still considered canon and have all this information and stuff. It seems like in 1992, the thought process was we can write a set of stories for grownups in, you know, the Heir to the Empire trilogy, and we can just tell a completely different story with those same characters um, for kids. And we're not going to worry about tying all that stuff together. And I think there's pros and cons, obviously, to that approach. But the pro for us is that we get this really goofy, fun Star Wars story that we, you know, like we might get a similar tone nowadays, but they would never go off in these sort of crazy directions like they did in 1992 because mm-hmm. everything ties together. And that's that's read to, or led to some really rewarding reading experiences, but it's also kind of, you miss the opportunity for some of this goofiness potentially. That's true. That's a good point because, oh my goodness, uh, there <laughs> is some goofiness. Um, I think let's just introduce the, some of the characters first. Um, so we have, uh, you know, we have our Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Han, Chewbacca, 3PO, R2-D2, Mon Mothma, Akbar. Um, you know, all of our returning heroes. Um, and then uh, introduced to the main villain in the series. And I mean, are we are we talking spoilers here? <laughs> um, I mean- is that fair? Yeah, I think it's fair. I think it's fair. Okay. Um, so I guess if you, I guess, tune out for a while. Um, but yeah, so the main villain in series is Trioculus, who is a three-eyed uh, uh, imperial um, who has uh, claimed uh, the the title of emperor um, after the death of Palpatine. And the reason he's been able to claim that is because of a scheme by um, many grand moffs. Uh, there's a whole, uh, a whole trio of major grand moffs here who have worked with Trioculus to lie about being the emperor's son and the uh, rightful heir to the emperor. It's not Thrawn, it's Trioculus, <laughs> the true heir to the Empire. <laughs> um, but you find out in the second book, The Lost City of the Jedi, that 
Trioculus isn't actually the Emperor's son, and he has and imprisoned the Emperor's true son, who is Triclop, who is another three-eyed man who uh, was deemed uh, unfit to rule the Empire um, because he was a little bit loopy, but he is the true son of Palpatine. Okay, see, I, that's actually a spoiler for me, which is fine because I'm not worried about oh. it, but uh, I'm only halfway through The Lost City of the Jedi. So I've read The Glove of Darth Vader and uh, about halfway through The Lost City of the Jedi. So, um, And uh, what is The Glove of Darth Vader? <laughs> yeah, The Glove of Darth Vader. This, I, did, I was going to ask you, I don't know if this is like a key premise of the Zahn trilogy or not, but um, to be for the rest of the empire, the grand moths and, and the imperial rulers and things to take you to believe that you are the, the true heir to the empire. Um, you, the prophecy, there's a prophecy, a dark side prophecy that says that the heir to the empire will wear the indestructible glove of Darth Vader. Uh, this glove cannot be destroyed. It will, it will survive anything, fire, water, anything. Um, and if you, in the true next ruler will be wearing that glove of Darth Vader. So the first mm-hmm. book is, uh, for Tracalus anyways, it's about tracking down that glove of Darth Vader because he needs it to legitimize himself as the true son of Palpatine and heir to the Empire. Yes, yes. Um... <laughs> So I want to I want to kind of set the stage about what kind of uh, what kind of person uh, Trioculus is, and so I'm I'm going to uh, I'm going to read an excerpt here. Um, this is from the Glove of Darth Vader, and so it says. The crowd continued to watch in hushed silence as Trioculus began to speak in a cold, throaty voice. My father, the Emperor, had many powers of the dark side, but without three eyes, he could never achieve perfection. It was told, it was known by the ancients that a dark lord with three eyes has a secret strength possessed by none other and so it is my destiny to rule over my father's empire and bring us the glory that he never achieved so you know obviously they're really kind of doubling down on this three eye thing (laughs) which is uh which is an interesting choice Uh um but yeah, there's definitely some entitlement uh, there with uh, Trioculus. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess the reason why the Emperor failed was just had two eyes. <laughs> That's, uh, I mean, v- Vader probably would have never betrayed him if he just had that third eye. That third eye, yeah. Um, I was reading some of The Lost City of the Jedi this morning, and uh, there's a great line where like Grand Moff Hisa, who's the sharp-toothed uh, uh, Grand Moff that's like Triaclis's most trusted aide. He comes in to, to share some bad news with him. <laughs> and the description said that Triaculus <laughs> just looked at him, all three, all three of his eyes rapidly blinking, you know, like in shock or whatever. Where you're <laughs> and I, was, I just thought that was really funny. Um, so, yeah, I guess, I guess that third eye is the, uh, is the key is the key to <laughs> Trioculus's uh, success. Although I haven't gotten to the end of the, the Zorba the Hutt's Revenge, so I don't know how successful mm. uh, Trioculus is in the long run. Uh, he also has um, sort of implants put into the fingers in one of his hands so that he could shoot lightning like the Emperor because um, Trioculus does not seem to actually have any... Although it's murky, at least in the first book and a half, it's murky if he's... It, the, the narrator will sometimes describe it as like uh, he has not advanced far enough yet in his dark side powers or whatever, but it doesn't actually mm-hmm. seem like he has any dark side powers. So I don't know. No, no. Yeah. He gets these mechanical implants in the, in the glove to, uh, to do all sorts of uh, parlor tricks. Yeah. Essentially. Um, but yeah, so I mean that's sort of the yeah. that's like the 
that's the triaculous part of it. But uh, the story also features Luke Skywalker, Admiral Akbar, Han Solo. Uh, all three of these stories, mm-hmm. I think, feature these characters, Princess Leia, Chewbacca. Um, so when it's not focused on the Empire, it's uh, I think it's going for like a really f- just like a kind of a fun, bouncy, adventure type thing with those characters. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like uh, Han Solo, um, interestingly, in uh, The Lost City of the Jedi, I think it's that one. Maybe it was the Glove of Darth Vader, but his big goal is to build uh, to build his floating home. He wants to build a, a mansion that floats, and he can't really mm-hmm. stick around and help the Rebel Alliance anymore. Sorry, Princess. Uh, my dream has always been to build this floating home, okay. and if I get bored on one cloud, I'll just float over to another one. <laughs> That's Han Solo's. So it's like a different vision for Han Solo post original trilogy than maybe we got from Lawrence Kasdan and J.J. Abrams. <laughs> Um, but it's cool. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's making the ultimate bachelor pad. Yeah, on on Cloud City, on Cloud City. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. Um, and it's still a will he won't he with Princess Leia at least early in this trilogy of books because <laughs> Luke Skywalker shows up and's like, "What are your intentions with my sister Han Solo?" And he's like, "Look, kiddo." And, uh, did you notice <laughs> that too? I don't think he ever says "kiddo" in the in the films, but he refers to Luke as "kiddo" <laughs> <laughs> here. And he's like, "Look, kiddo. Um, if I'm ever going to get married, Leia's at the top of my list, but uh, yeah. I just can't settle down yet." <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah like we said it's goofy but it's it's really fun but yeah. uh then i don't know if you had any more excerpts you wanted to read from before uh from uh bk you know before ken but, oh yeah uh, <laughs> yeah think, before it really kicks into high gear yeah because i and i haven't gotten too far into this stuff unfortunately but um but uh this this these three books and then three more books that followed maybe the, the following year um, are are part of the Jedi Prince series, and it turns out mm-hmm. the Jedi Prince in question is uh, like a twelve or thirteen year old boy named Ken who mm-hmm. lives below the surface of Yavin Four, mm-hmm. and is uh, taken care of by some some droids are taking care of him, but he's like anxious to get out there and start his life. He's been studying Jedi. He has to write essays about the Jedi. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, learn a lot about that. He 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 tends to mix up uh, um, uh, his his uh, historical data about uh, about uh, the Jedi that he studies. Like uh, he got in trouble with one of his droids because he he stated in an essay or something that it was uh, Luke and Chewie flying the Falcon in the Battle of uh, Endor or something like that. Mm-hmm. So anyway, it's just like it's one of those things that they love to do um, in some of these early, well, let's be honest in, in like pretty much all star Wars uh, <laughs> writing books and stuff to like have these little winky, winky nod, nod moments uh, calling back like trivia from the original star Wars films. But, uh, but yeah, Ken, Ken is going to, I think kind of become the focus of, of uh, these books going forward. So he's sort of an alternate universe version of Ray, right? Like the next generation of, uh, of hero for the star Wars universe. Yeah, I mean, he almost feels a little more like uh, Anakin Skywalker in uh, The Phantom Menace to mm. me. Um, <laughs> like, just uh, uh, just kind of his arc throughout these books. Um, kind of a... He, he seems like a... Um, what, are the, what do they call that in literature? It's not a foil, but like something to reflect the reader. Um, a character in there to oh, like a cipher. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. a cipher. Um, because being like a twelve-year-old boy, and I think the way that, in the same way that you know Lucas intended, like young Anakin to uh, or younger viewers with in the Phantom Menace. Um, yeah, he feels like a like an entry point in a way for the reader to project themselves into the book because the target audience for this book is definitely like nine to 13 year old boys probably. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's like, that's the, obviously um, like the staple of children's and young adult literature is to feature the protagonist that's that, uh, that the reader can really relate to, um, you know, because they're, they're in the similar, you know, period in their life or whatever. So. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's cool. Um, well, Ryan, you're the expert on on the Jedi Prince trilogy. Are there any big points we're missing or we should cover here? Um, yeah, absolutely. 
<laughs> so, I mean, just on a personal note, like part of the reason I'm like so invested in this is because these are the first Star Wars books I read. Um, I think I talked about on the last Power of the 90s that like I picked up Heir to the Empire, but it was like way above my level um, at the time. Um, so I wasn't really able to access that text. But once I found these books, like I was actually able to read them. And um, but even like as a kid, like I, I like, I don't know, Ken always felt a little, uh, I don't know, a little forced. And I was like, I don't really care about this guy. Like, I want to know about like Luke Skywalker and, uh, you know, Han Solo and Chewbacca and Princess Leia. Like, I don't, I don't really know what's the deal with this kid. <laughs> like, he's not, he's not in the movies. He's not really part of this. Um, but I did, uh, you know, I do remember being pretty invested in uh, in the the Trioculus uh, arc, and uh, especially Zorba the Hutt. That was Zorba is what resonated with me the most, and like is kind of when I books, it's like who I think of as the uh, kind of gray area villain in them. Uh, but we'll get to that in a moment. I did just want to share um, one bit here. Um, this is the part where uh, uh, Ken drops his, what do they call it? Computer notebook. He mm -hmm. drops his computer notebook. And uh, Baji, the rhyming forest healer, uh, who lives above the lost city of the Jedi on Yavin 4. Um, he finds, he picks up the computer notebook, and uh, it says in the inside, belongs to Ken, Dome House 12, South Jedi Lane. Uh, that's his address, <laughs> which I thought was really excellent. I saw a drawing uh, when he was leaving um, the the city of the Jedi or whatever. Um, like in, in one of the drawings, you see like the address written somewhere, like South Jedi Lane or whatever. And I thought, oh man, I wonder. I wonder. I mean, I really do. I wonder if we're going to see South Jedi Lane on Octo uh, somewhere. Um, oh. If possibly Ken will show up on Octo. You know what I mean? Um, considering his association with uh, lost Jedi cities and things like that, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah, he's uh maybe he's evolved into one of the caretakers. <laughs> he's a uh... <laughs> could be. Could be. Uh, I don't know. Um, or a uh, bit from uh, Lost City of the Jedi, and I shared this with you the other day, and this was obviously something I did not remember from reading these books as a kid, and I did not put these pieces together. Um, in recent years, but I thought this was really interesting and funny. Um, so this is Ken meeting Solo, and I'm going to, I'm going to read a, a somewhat lengthy excerpt here. Uh, we know who we are, kid, Han said. What we don't know is who you are and what you've been doing here. I'm Ken. He, he, I've always wanted to meet you, Mr. Solo, for just about my entire life. You're one of the best Karelian pilots in the whole galaxy. What do you mean one of? Han replied. <laughs> you know anyone better? <laughs> Snoke Larone made the trip from here to the Bespin system in 15 standard time parts, Ken said, without even batting an eyelash. The best the Millennium Falcon has ever done is 18 standard time parts. I looked that up in the Jedi Library. His eyes in amazement. Who was this kid? Okay, okay. I'll admit, I'm impressed, Han said. But Snoke Larone got wiped out in the Battle of Endor. We're talking about living Karelian pilots. <laughs> so uh. that's... I think we've found our answer to who Snoke is. Yeah, it's so it's so weird how these names like pop up, you know. Um, I mean, number one, could it be that Ken assumed the identity of Snoke Larone and uh, you know made his way out to the to the oh God? I always forget what they're called, the unknown regions or whatever it is, way yeah. out there. It's possible. 
it's possible. Um, perhaps the uh, the sort of dark force um, out there referenced in in the aftermath books is in fact Ken. I don't know, but uh, no. But it's just mm-hmm. like it's really interesting how these names pop up, like Snoke here, and then uh, I think there wasn't there also a Kylo Ren or a character whose name was like one letter away from Kylo Ren's in uh, some expanded universe material too uh, that people went back and found. So I think it's. I mean, obviously, it's got to be totally just a coincidence that, you know, people are coming up with goofy sounding names and two different authors or writers came up with the name of Snoke or whatever. But it's a pretty funny little Easter egg there for sure. Well, or is it coincidence? (laughs) Because um, something we can actually uh, pin down here, and I'm not 100% sure on this, but in, in these... In this book, uh, in the Glove of Darth Vader, it is, I believe, the first appearance of the term uh, dunium, yeah. um, which is the like super strong uh, metal that was, uh, I believe, used in the development of the Death Star. Um, so it's it first appeared in. Um, Glove of Darth Vader, and it's been referenced uh, in Catalyst, uh, Rebel Rising, which are both, you know, new canon uh, books, and it's, like, super important in Thrawn. Like, it's kind of uh, one of the major plot points in the book Thrawn. So... So you're thinking the powers that be at Lucasfilm now... Uh, a couple years ago, when it was like we need to relaunch this uh, this Star Wars universe, we need to write a new a new trilogy of films. We need to get the publishing going again. Um, mm-hmm. You think maybe the the place they jumped off from was the Glove of Darth Vader by uh, by Paul Davids and Hollis Davids? Like that was a major source I of inspiration. Think, I think just because these books are so under the radar that uh, maybe uh, maybe they're digging into them i think you know people are parsing through the the heir to the empire trilogy looking for clues but maybe the answers are found in here but uh, it could have been right under our noses all this time i know i think we i think we need to be careful though to uh not let them know that we're on to them like so <laughs> like as you, we can't be like tweeting pablo hidalgo about uh the zorba express or anything because uh gonna fall apart but uh, <laughs> I don't know all right uh-huh. I, I see a bit of Carillion in uh in Snoke when I look at those uh those uh those leaked, leaked images photos yeah, yeah. The orchard of Snoke okay. yeah well we'll see um I would die if there was some kind of connection <laughs> between you know Snoke's identity or like major plot points in The Last Jedi and The Glove of Darth Vader which is just the most ridiculously fun uh, book and, and series of books and I, I think they're so worth checking out honestly I do um, they're goofy as hell but they are hilarious and, uh, and, and fun and uh, you know great art like we said and uh, just a really interesting like um, artifact from a totally different time in like Star Wars, you know, books and storytelling and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So I think it's it's really fun. Um, yeah. Get them for cheap, and uh, and yeah, I would I would track them down. Okay, I do want to uh, close us out with uh, with one more excerpt here, Love it. Love it. Um, and this is from uh, Zorba the Hutt's Revenge. Uh, so this is uh, Han. Um, spoiler does uh, does get his house built. Um, and he's having a housewarming party, and uh, this is from that scene. Every few minutes, Han had to jump up and run to the kitchen to check on the gourmet feast he was cooking on his nanowave stove. Then Chewbacca put on a chef's apron and took over the cooking so Han could dance with Princess Leia. The band knew all of Han's favorite Karelian folk dances. He even taught Leia how to do the space pirate boogie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, space pirate boogie. Yeah, totally. Yeah. 
And uh, if you want to know where the story goes from there, um, and to know more about Zorba, Zorba the Hutt, which I think is a very, very interesting character, um, and his tie to the original trilogy characters is uh, is interesting. Um, book two, the next three uh, three books in the series, which uh, I guess the sequel trilogy we could call it. Um, that actually came out in 1993. So uh, we'll be talking about those books on the next episode yeah. of Power of the 90s. So uh, please look forward to it. <laughs> All right. Very good. Cool. Yeah, I will uh, jump on Amazon and get those ordered ASAP. So... Um, all right. Well, we do have one more book to talk about. Uh, we'll have a, a probably a shorter discussion than we did about the uh, the um, the uh, Glove of Darth Vader and, and Jedi Prince uh, sort of series there. But um, the Han Solo Adventures was released, uh, re-released, I guess we'd say, in uh, 1992, and this is a paperback collection. Actually, maybe hardcover also, uh, or just paperback. Anyway, a um, uh, a collection of the Brian Daly Han Solo trilogy of books um, that were originally released in the 70s and uh, were some of the first sort of, you know, Star Wars novels and expanded universe uh, novels, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, those uh, those were re-released. And, you know, I'm looking at the cover right now and it's like a classic cover that I remember seeing all over the place in bookstores and things like that uh, at mm -hmm. the time. Um, so, um, we were talking before we started recording about the fact that, you know, we're really looking forward to reading these books, uh, especially with the Han Solo movie coming up, but, um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're not really through them yet. So that's going to probably be eventually its own kind of episode. Um, did you ever read these like, you know, when you were younger or in the nineties or anything like that? No, I've never actually read these. Yeah. Um, we do, though, Ryan, you know, for a special bonus <laughs> yeah. for our video uh, viewers. Uh -huh. um, we do have two-thirds of the trilogy here um, yeah. in hardcover, the original releases. Um, so I've got uh, Han Solo at Star's End, which is just about the best name for anything Star Wars I've ever heard. Like, I, I love that name so much, Han Solo at Star's End. So cool. That is and perfect. What is the title of uh, your book there? Is it The Lost Legacy or Han Solo's Revenge? Uh, Han Solo's Revenge. And this is actually a book club version. Oh, the sci-fi um, book club? Or just a book you know, club? You know, it just says book club edition. Okay. Okay. That's cool. Um, but yeah, and this is from 1979. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, Han Solo at Star's End, I, I think, is 78. Let me check the copyright here if I can. But, um, but yeah, these were really early uh, Star Wars books. But they are, they're really well regarded um, as well. So I'm, I'm excited to get back into them. Um, yeah, this, oh, this one is 79. I thought this was the first one. Yours says 78? 79. Oh, 79. Okay. So they're both 79. Okay. Um, but anyway, uh, they're, re they're really well regarded and, uh, you know, people kind of, um, I think remember them for how fun they were and how uh, good of a job they did of capturing the character of Han Solo. So probably an obvious choice to, to re-release in 92 as, uh, you know, Lucasfilm and, and, uh, Lucasfilm publishing was looking forward to, you know, I think after the success, obviously of heir to the empire, it really got the ball rolling on Star Wars publishing again, but uh, I'm, you know, guessing it's gonna. It was taking some time to get new stories uh, cooked up and put out. So, why not uh, fill that gap by re-releasing these classic books? Um, yeah, yeah, and the, I mean, like I said, the uh, the cover is just so 90s, and that's uh, that's a, a really cool thing. And I think this was super popular because um, there were a couple of uh, of re-releases. There was one in '92. Um, there was one in 94, they re-released them again in 2002, and now there's a, there's a Legends version of them as well. So, um, this is like this trilogy kind of put together in paperback format is, uh, something that's really probably been around, um, since 92 with, uh, not too many, um, too many gaps where it was missing or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, this is, these are like some of the books that you... Like any time you're looking at Star Wars books, like the mass market paperbacks, like ever, 
there's there's always one or two copies to this like on any like barnes and noble shelf like yeah. at any any time i feel like yep yep absolutely all right well let's move on to a couple other books quickly um i'm thinking we don't have too much uh to cover on these i don't have either of these books i don't know if you do um but uh one is george lucas the creative impulse by charles champlin and that was from Abrams' book. Mm-hmm. And another is Star Wars from Concept to Screen to Collectible by the great Steve Sansweet. And that one was released by Chronicle Books. So I actually ordered both of these books um, for this episode. Uh, you can find them like really, really cheap um, on Amazon. Again, they're like, you know, like six or seven bucks shipped to get these books. Um, and I, both of them seemed really interesting to me. I did not get them in time to, uh, read them for the episode. I still haven't gotten them yet. So, (laughs) um, but I will, uh, I'll definitely be reading them whenever they, uh, whenever they show up. Um, and kind of the only reason I found out about these books is because, uh, they were mentioned in the Star Wars year by year. Uh, book, which is just an incredible hardbound uh, book that chronicles, uh, you know, every year, um, starting, I think, in like the 40s or 50s, um, that led from like the influences for Star Wars. And then it just goes year by year of like, once Star Wars is released, like everything kind of related to Star Wars. Um, and it's just, it's an incredible book. Um, that I think came out last year, um, but I got a copy of it, and it uh, it's pretty comprehensive. Like it's it has a few things that like I didn't find on like Wikipedia and stuff when we were kind of working on show notes for this. So uh, that's that's been a really great resource for kind of planning these episodes, and it's just a fun read. So yeah, yeah, I, I need to get that, um, but I'm really thankful that you got it, Ryan, and. Um you know, you've really been like the, uh, you're kind of the Star Wars archaeologist here who's gone through and really found uh, <laughs> most of the stuff to put on our our, uh, our, our show notes here. So um, you've done the digging and found some pretty sweet stuff. Um, yeah, you know what? I, I, I really need to track down both of these. Um, would love to do that. I think that uh, I need to get Star Wars from concept to screen to collectible from Steve Sansweet. Mm. Um I would love to, I don't know why I have never done this. I need to do this, but uh, I would love to just have like a complete collection of um, every book that Steve Sansweet has put out for Star Wars. Cause you know, you think about the nineties, you think about this period of time um, in Star Wars history and Steve Sansweet is so responsible for a lot of this stuff and um, being a huge, huge impact in, in part of um, bringing Star Wars back and, you know, stoking Star Wars fandom and all that kind of thing. So you know, this is a guy that I think anyone who's a Star Wars fan, even if you just recently became a Star Wars fan or you're younger, you know, and weren't really um, around at this time, like we owe so much to Steve Sansweet, you know, um, mm-hmm. the best one of the best weekends of my life and a huge part of, you know, propelling my Star Wars fandom is the original Star Wars celebration in your hometown of Denver, Colorado. And I think Steve Sansweet was instrumental in that and um, in getting that going in like, you know, just star wars collectibles everything you know he's just a huge huge uh a voice in the star wars community and and such a such a uh a part of of star wars collecting and and star wars fandom so i need to get all of his books i want to get this one um so that's something i need to do another thing i need to do just very quickly here is is make it out to rancho obi-wan uh as well um at some time so that's what steve sansweet is up to now is um is running the the incredible um, Star Wars Museum, Rancho Obi Wan. So, yeah, I I really want to do that at some point. But now, like, there's also like starting to plan like Disney trips and mm. such. Uh, is going to make all these uh, Star Wars vacations. Uh, there's there's going to be a lot of options soon. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, Steve Sansweet, I, I don't know if he gives all of the tours at Rancho Obi-Wan, but he gives a lot of them. So 
Um, that would just be a wild experience, I think, to be out there and oh, and uh, look through Steve Sansweet's collection with a, a guided tour from Steve Sansweet. <laughs> so yeah, would um, it be so, weird so, to bring something for him to sign? That's a good question. I don't know. I would think he would be amenable <laughs> like, to doing that because um, it's like it's kind of like his, <laughs> you know, his. Um, but like i don't know it's not like a really a fan convention but man like that that action figure guide that i have by him like i have like like poured over that so much in my life that uh that would be cool yeah or you could bring your copy of from concept to screen to collectible you know so it would be awesome uh okay last episode of power of the 90s for 91 and uh 90 and 91 we talked a ton about west end games um and the role-playing games and there were a bunch of source books and other uh materials put out from west end games in 1992 um i think we kind of covered the whole west end games thing at least for for now on the last episode but want to at least talk about uh about which books were released here um so there was the Heir to the Empire source book, the Dark Force Rising source books, uh, Planet of the Galaxy Volume 2, Mission to Liana, Planet of the Mists, The Abduction, The Politics of Contraband, and The Game Master Screen, all put out from West End Games in 1992. And Man, did you have the any... Politics of Contraband. That <laughs> is the title. Yeah, that's <laughs> like, intriguing. It's, it sounds like a... Like a, like a like a punk song or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, um, and the Game Master screen, I see there's a link to uh, some information about this one. I don't know if uh, if that one is uh, particularly interesting or... Oh No, it's, it's just oh. like a Dungeon Master screen. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Okay, I'm checking out a photo of it right now. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and it's not yeah. Star Wars specific either. Or is it? No, no, it is. Oh, it is um, this is specific. just this is just like what a I th- I don't know why I put that link in there. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, it just well, it's I'm, what a, I, I think maybe it was to because I didn't know if you were familiar with what a game master. I was just going to say I'm you glad you did because I, <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I'd yeah, it's just I've seen those, but uh, I didn't know what it's called. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, like we have never played the game. Um, so we don't have a lot to contribute here, but um, I am really excited about the announcement that just happened that the uh, the f- original uh, book and I think one other book I- are getting re- like reprinted uh, this year and like to celebrate the anniversary of the role playing game. So yeah, that's, that, uh, that's pretty cool. It's incredible. Uh, they're limited limited edition. Uh, I hear. I'm sure they won't be too, too limited, but um, yeah, for sure. I want to track those down immediately when those come out. I think that's the, that's just the best idea to re-release those um, and to kind of celebrate those. So those will have a, a forward by Pablo Hidalgo. Um, not sure what else might be different about those in comparison to the originals, but uh, I, I will... heard they're going to be relatively unchanged. Okay, cool. Well, I will definitely support that because that's, that's a pretty cool and exciting thing that those are being re-released. Um, yeah. Okay. Should we move on to comics, Ryan? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We've got basically two big releases in, in 92, um, which is the continuation of the dark empire series, dark empire one through six. Uh, we talked, I, I talked kind of a lot about those on the last episode and, um, uh, on Power of the 90s, uh, 9091. And I'm thinking, realizing now, I probably should have held off on a lot of that discussion discussion <laughs> until this episode uh, because the majority of Dark Empire was actually released in 1992. Um, did you have a chance to go back and look through these? Um, no, I didn't. I didn't get around to revisiting them. Okay. In fall. Okay. Well, uh, it's definitely a pretty interesting comic series. I think, I, like I said, I talked a bunch about it before, so I won't uh, belabor the point. Some very cool stuff, some definitely kind of weird choices, I thought, and some places where it maybe repeated some of the major beats of the original trilogy a little too much. Didn't necessarily love what they did with Luke Skywalker, but um, but it's interesting for sure. And there's more Dark Empire um, that'll be coming up in, in the following um, Power of the 90s uh, shows too, because 
I think there's three sets of this series, right? Like three sets of comics for this. There's at least two series, um, okay. possibly three. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, what's really interesting to me about this is that at this point we have essentially three different uh, sequel trilogies happening um, concurrently. Um, you have your Thrawn trilogy, you have your uh, Glove of Darth Vader trilogy, and you have Dark Empire, and they're all taking place after uh, Return of the Jedi and all kind of happening at the same time. But Yeah, yeah, definitely would have been confusing. Um, part of me kind of likes that too, though, like I said before, uh, also because at that point, you know, as a Star Wars fan, I, I think at least for someone like me, it would be very clear that the movies are their own thing and then yeah. you can enjoy these Star Wars stories outside of that. Um, whereas now where we are, it's a really good place to be and I'm thankful for it and I enjoy it a ton. But at the same time, like, you know, when a book comes out that you don't like so much or you feel like a, a certain author takes Star Wars in a direction that doesn't really work for you, mm -hmm. it's like, well, how do I then sort of make this fit into my you know mentality or my viewing yeah my head cannon for the movies yeah. um i've learned to let go and not worry about that stuff at all yeah. anymore and i don't care so i just kind of like i i end up you know viewing the stuff i don't like probably similarly to how i would view you know the third or fourth you know sort of version of what happened after the battle of endor like we're talking about and just sort of say mm -hmm. oh that one's not for me so yeah it's cool uh but. Um, I do think uh, next year uh, in 93 is when the comics get really interesting. Okay. Um, I believe that's when the Tales of the Jedi uh, series launches from Dark Horse. And that's when they go the Republic era. And I think like start breaking away from the like sequel trilogy mentality um is i think when like star wars literature gets um gets a lot more interesting um when cool. they yeah so we'll uh i'm i'm really excited to revisit those books uh when we uh when we get into 93 yeah, which which should be uh, sometime in mid to late September, I think, once we uh, come down from our Force Friday uh, hype and excitement. Oh my God. Yeah, I'm going to be buried in a pile of porgs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, many stuffed porgs here. Uh, no better way to go. Um, yeah, I was actually thinking too, we'll have to talk about this off air and figure it out down the road. But, you know, uh, Power of the 90s is like our monthly series, but I don't know how we'll be able to keep it going and like, December, you know, maybe, you know, maybe November, December, January, those are going to be some pretty busy months, I think, Star Wars wise. So we'll see. We might do a few years, take a couple months off and then re and come back to it. But yeah, I think we're going to have to start splitting episodes too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because once we get into like 95, 96, 97, and then I mean, all the way from basically 95, Phantom Menace in 99, there is so much. Oh, like it gets crazy so yeah. yeah 99 is gonna be i don't know Whew. we could start a whole new podcast about star wars in 1999 probably but uh That's i just want to i just want to mention quickly that uh, i picked up and i kind of made a mistake here i picked up this uh, uh. star wars omnibus a long time ago from uh dark horse and uh the yeah. reason the reason I did that is because um, I saw that the, the classic Star Wars series, um, Dark Horse started putting out the classic Star Wars series in 92. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I'm just dumb, I guess. And I thought like classic Star Wars 1 through 20 was like the first 20, you know, Marvel Star Wars Books. comics. Yeah. But that's not what it is. It was Dark Horse going back into that era and pulling out things and, you know, putting them into this classic Star Wars series, as I understand it. It was the newspaper strip. Oh, newspaper strips. Uh, Archie Goodwin, I believe. That's what these first ones are. But then as classic Star Wars goes on, then they do, I think, pull in Marvel comics and stuff as well. So um, we'll see yes. as we get further into it. Yeah. But what I have here is a collection of the the early Star Wars uh, Marvel comics. So uh, oh, this will become relevant. Which is I'm still sure super awesome. <laughs> oh, it rules. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Um, oh. This was a pretty... This is the most expensive... Uh, omnibus from dark horse i think in the star wars line unless i'm missing one this first one and i got this it's in you know i would say very good condition 
Uh, it's not mint or anything, a little bit of rabbit ears or whatever, but, uh, I got this for like $15 shipped, maybe something like that. And nice. it's so cool. Yeah, it's really good. But, um, you know, you're talking about like tales of the Jedi and stuff. I'm pretty sure a lot of those things, a lot of those, uh, issues and mm -hmm. things like that are collected in some of these omnibus series. So, um, yeah. man, I'm, I'm, I'm just really loving collecting star Wars books lately. And, you know, they're a numbered series, the omnibus. So like once you have one, you kind of need two. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sure. so this is a Man, rabbit hole. And those comics get weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. like once they start like kind of really diverging from uh, from the films, uh, oh my goodness. Yes. It's really fun stuff. Yeah, that'll be fun to talk about for sure. Um, did you get a chance to look at any classic Star Wars stuff here? Nope, nope. I do really want um this collection i've never actually read the the newspaper strips um i do i do want that collection i will definitely pick it up if i see it around but yeah and there is happen. there is a right now there is a really good uh kind of series of re-releases of the marvel comics that are being done i believe in hardcover a big format um the first volume mm. just released i think earlier this year and there's a second volume releasing uh, early next year, and they sound like super high quality, um, kind of complete uh, collections of those of those uh, newspaper strips. I have no familiarity with them, no experience with them at all. So um, that's mm -hmm. going to be really cool. I think that first collection is around, I want to say maybe around forty dollars on Amazon, yeah, in between like thirty five and fifty, something like that. But probably like a, just a beautiful like coffee table like reference book, you know. So. I, and I think if we're thinking about the same ones, um, those those co collections are um, they're like completely like digitally restored, um, and I think they might actually be digitally recolored. I think is uh, um, was kind of a if I'm not sure if it's these that we're talking about or maybe it was the movie adaptations both but i know there was some controversy with like marvel re releasing some of the some of the old um star wars comics uh, with uh being totally like digitally recolored and stuff to make them look they kind of just look like modern books in a way and okay. i think for like purists or people you know looking for that archival um feeling they weren't really as into it okay yeah, and there's uh, there's actually I think there's been two different re-releases recently of uh, these these uh, mm -hmm. classic newspaper comics. Uh, one I want to say one is from Marvel and the other's from IDW or something along those lines. Oh, oh okay, that that could definitely be. Um, well, I have to go to Barnes and Noble this weekend to pick up the new Entertainment Weekly. Okay. So, uh, so I will definitely um, look and see like what the deal is with those. Yeah, I think the pr I have one in my wish list on Amazon, you know, that I use to kind of save stuff for later. I think uh -huh. the preferred one is this one that is put together um, uh, by uh, Russ Manning is like the lead uh, editor um, on the book. And um, I want to say, or is, or is he actually, I guess he's the one who, he's the artist maybe behind the comics. Um, yeah, it was Russ Manning's the artist behind the comics. But anyway, I'm just trying to figure out like how to delineate this version from the other ones. Um, yeah. It's called Star Wars, the Classic Newspaper Comics Volume 1. Uh, oh, it's okay. a hardcover. It looks really great. And it is in my Amazon wish list right now. It's a list price of $49.99, but it's down to $28.93 on Amazon right now. Oh, nice. Um, and uh, the, I'm sorry, the uh, editor I was talking about, I, I believe is uh, Rich Handley. And if I'm not mistaken, I heard him interviewed on Jedi Journals, which is my favorite Star Wars books podcast. I know you listen to that one mm -hmm. as well, Ryan. And, uh, you know, they talked extensively about the process of putting this together and the, you know, the kind of um, restoration um, that went on. And uh, the way it was discussed made it seem like, you know, the version to get. So that's a really good deal and uh, something you can pick up now on Amazon. And like I said, the... Uh, or anywhere. And then the second one is coming out um, early next year. Nice. Cool. Nice. Yeah. All right. 
So we've talked Star Wars books. We've talked, we've talked Star Wars role-playing games. We've talked Star Wars comics. Uh, it's time to talk Star Wars video games. And 1992 was, I think, a super good year, a uh, very important year for Star Wars video games. Why don't, we, why don't we start, Ryan, with uh, The Empire Strikes Back on the NES and then uh, okay. move on to the, the main event. Um, I have been playing Empire Strikes Back on NES. Uh, I actually have a video ready to go on our uh, Blockade Runner YouTube channel, so I'll post that next week um, alongside or shortly after uh, put the final version of this show up. Um, but uh, it is a, a pretty cool, pretty cool, pretty difficult, um, you know, NES game. I know that you uh, recently picked up the Game Boy game too. Were you able to play that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have it here. Uh, I have not played too much of it. Mm -hmm. um, the Game Boy version. I, I think the NES version is still published by JVC, mm -hmm. um, like the, uh, you know, the original uh, NES Star Wars game and also the uh, Super Star Wars. Um, but the Game Boy game, it feels pretty... Uh, Pretty technically impressive for a Game Boy game. Um, it has some uh, pretty uh, iffy uh, difficulty spikes in the in the platforming, um, as is often the case. So I haven't dug too deep into it, but um, it's it feels like kind of your maybe like a, a bit of a cut above your standard licensed Game Boy game. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely not like flat out terrible, but it's also not like, I don't know, like Link's Awakening or something. <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> but what is your, I've never actually played the NES game. Uh, what's your experience been with that? Yeah, it's cool. You know, I played through the first chunk of it. Um, and like I said, I recorded video of that, so I'll put it up. Uh, it starts out in the Ice Caverns of Hoth. So I don't know if that's the same for the Game Boy version or not. Mm -hmm. It is. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, you know, there's a lot of things because I just played, you know, Star Wars on NES for um, last month's Power of the 90 show for 91. And, uh, you know, that game, there's some things I really like about it. There's some things that I feel, you know, could be improved. And it's not the Empire Strikes Back. It's made uh, from well, it's published by JVC um, it was developed by Sculptured Software, which I think is in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. uh, or was in Salt Lake City. So that's a different developer than the NES Star Wars game. Um, but there is some carryover in staff between the two games as well. So it feels like, I guess the, the point I'm trying to make here is that it doesn't feel completely like a direct sequel in the way that, you know, spoilers, the Super Star Wars games that we're about to talk about um, do feel like just continuations. You know, it's basically the same engine and, and, and art style and the same game, um, you know, being updated for each movie. This, the art style is different. It looks different. Um, you know, the the control is different. Uh, it plays differently than, than Star Wars on NES. Uh, you can see the similarities, like the shared, you know, some similarities, but it, it's, um, it's not totally the same. So, yeah, there's things I like about um, Empire. There's things I like about Star Wars on NES. And I'll, I'll talk, you know, if you want to hear more detailed thoughts on that, I would say check out the, the YouTube video while I play through it. But, um, for instance, the way the game looks, I think it looks really good in some places, but then there's other areas where I feel like, or other aspects of it where I feel like it's kind of ugly. Um, the Luke Skywalker sprite is... Uh, He's more probably more uh, going for a more realistic look than in um, Star Wars on NES, which I kind of prefer. Maybe the the more cartoony um, look of of uh, of the characters and things in in Star Wars, but the gameplay is pretty solid. Uh, definitely tough, you know. I got as far as I could, and it, it was it was tricky. Um, but it's 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 it, you know I think especially with these eight bit and 16-bit era games, um, what I really appreciate about them when I'm going back to play them is how much the game makes me feel like I'm being dropped into a sort of surreal version of the movie and given the opportunity to just kind of like bounce around and fight enemies and just feel like I'm, I'm having a, an interactive Star Wars experience, you know? These days, you know, playing Star Wars Battlefront and even like the Rogue Squadron games on GameCube and stuff like that, you could get 
like really realistic uh, and very convincing, like, you know, in the Star Wars movies kind of feeling from those games. With these ones, what I appreciate is how they're kind of surreal and uh, just an alternate you know not alternate universe but just it's it's just so the presentation the 8-bit style it's so far removed from what a film looks like that uh it's just a lot of fun to to sort of get this like way different version of a star wars um environment and star wars setting and characters and worlds and all that stuff so um all that's pretty cool in in empire on nes and you know good music um I, I like the interpretations of the of the Star Wars music, um, but yeah, like I said, you know, I would say if you're more interested in Empire uh, and you have a chance, check out the video because you can see it running, and I'll, I'll have some thoughts to share um, in the video. Nice, nice. Um, yeah, that sounds fun. I do want to. Um, I'm still waiting for my uh, retro USB AVS to arrive. Um, have been on pre-order for that for a while. Um, but when I do get that, I, um, I'm definitely going to buy um, both Star Wars and Empire cartridges um, for, uh, for my collection um, and because I want to play those games. But also, I think something we uh, failed to neglect the, um, on the last episode is this... There is a Star Wars game on uh, Game Gear and I believe Sega Master System yep. that uh, was released in either 91 or 92. Um, but I'm not sure if that's a port of the N or a version of the NES game or if it's like a different take on it or what the deal is with that. So that's kind of another like 8 bit star wars game yeah i haven't played those but i did uh look into those when i was kind of researching nes star wars and they are it is the same game um but there are definitely differences i think i want to say it's the game it's either the game gear yeah, maybe it's the game gear version but uh one one of them at least has a couple different levels um uh, they look a little different between platforms um so it's the same game but it would be interesting to play it kind of on each platform and compare the differences mm -hmm. but yeah essentially the same game with some you know some sometimes you know fairly significant differences between platforms but yeah nice nice Okay, um, Ryan, I think anybody our age has super fond memories, if they're Star Wars fans, super, super fond memories of the Super Star Wars series on the SNES. Um, mm -hmm. I, You know what? I'm going to be... I'm just going to say it. I think, like, Super Star Wars on Super Nintendo is one of the maybe, like, top five, like, Star Wars media, you know, releases of... The 90s you know you've got like your heirs of the empire you've got re-releases of the the movies on home video the power of the force toy line being re-released i would put super star wars like up there with those things in terms of both like fun factor and also just like bringing star wars back you know um mm -hmm. so i you know i loved playing these games on the super nintendo as a kid uh as like a young adult or early teenager i guess in the 90s uh, i thought they were so 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 cool um and i'm i have a feeling that you probably played a bunch as a kid too right yeah yeah and i mean these the, uh these games uh this one in particular um actually i would say super star wars and super empire strikes back um were really big deals um i remember like you know this being on the cover of nintendo power like getting my issue of nintendo power and having like darth vader on the cover and being like whoa this is this is pretty crazy um and yeah i mean i think that's uh that was you know a huge uh a huge magazine um for you know kids our age at that time um so i think that was like a big way of like reaching us at that time and like you know as far as like star wars fandom goes oh yeah definitely definitely and uh you know there there are just so much i actually have the uh, nintendo power in the closet back there i dropped the ball i should have pulled that prop out for our video too <laughs> um but uh yeah the nintendo power coverage was huge but uh but yeah it was just like such a it was it was such a colorful and heightened and like fun version of 
um, of Star Wars uh, or the Star Wars property that uh, I think, yeah, it was it was uh, definitely a big deal for kids, you know, because the movies were probably starting to, I don't want to say show their age because they're in a lot of ways, they're timeless, obviously, but uh, they, they weren't fresh anymore in terms of a, just like their release, right? Like this is 1992. You're talking what, 15 years since the original star Wars film had come out almost 10 years since there'd been a new star Wars movie in theaters. Um, and there weren't any Star Wars cartoons, you know, or anything like that. So this, I think, and this is even before, like, the Star Wars toy line had been re-released. So, mm-hmm. yeah, to put these games out and have them be, you know, they're pretty flashy. Like I said, very colorful, um, just really fun and and cool games to put these out on a, on a platform like Super Nintendo and, um, you know, kind of give kids access to Star Wars in this way, I think, was a huge, huge deal. Um, they're tough games. Uh, they're really tough games, actually. Um, and Super Star Wars might be the toughest of all of them. Um, I think just because it's the least forgiving in terms of like the like having a password system and uh, that sort of thing, or not having a password system, I guess you'd say. Um, so it's it's pretty tough in that regard. Um, but uh, but yeah, they're cool. I think one of my favorite things about the Super Star Wars games is the way that. Uh, it will present things. Well, it, it sort of like tells the story of the movie, but then it does like wild variations on on, on that as well. Um, you'll find yourself fighting uh, characters or or aliens or whatever that are nowhere to be found in the Star Wars movies, and it'll really kind of um, take some liberty with with uh, with the Star Wars license and do just some goofy stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, also like, I think this game, uh, super star Wars in particular was, um, kind of noteworthy, um, you know, coming out like the, the second year that, uh, the SNES was available in North America. Um, it had been out a little longer in Japan, but, uh, it was also like a big showcase for the mode seven visuals. Um, oh, yeah in those speeder sections, which, uh, again, um, kind of like, you know, uh, like the launch title F zero, um, kind of showcase that the super NES could kind of trick you into thinking that it was, could run like 3d games. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that was like, you know, that was really, uh, really pushing it for licensed games like to, um, and you know, that's kind of the, you know, the the Lucas Lucas Arts I guess uh, you know vision of always pushing technology and you know we're going to see that in a big way in 1993 with some of their uh, PC releases but that was already kind of like you know uh, Lucas you know Star Wars video games being like you know really pushing um, tech in like the video game space as well yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I think these are, like we said, super important to Star Wars, super important uh, Super Nintendo releases. Um, I think the rest of the gaming world feels that way too. And, you know, Star Wars fandom as well, because you can actually get these games in a number of different ways now uh, on digital platforms too, Mm -hmm. which is not always the case with, uh, with Star Wars games of this vintage. So um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, I have uh, a copy here of uh, Super Star Wars, the NES or the SNES cartridge. And uh, actually, when I, I got another working Super Nintendo um, a couple years ago, and I think the first thing I did was uh, get on eBay and get, you know, all three games in this uh, Super Star Wars series. Um, so that kind of speaks to, you know, um, how important uh, part of the Super Nintendo library I think they are. Um, so you can get them that way. If you still have a Wii, um, or I guess a Wii U, right? You can buy yeah. them. Well, actually, no. They're are they? They're, I don't. They're probably not available on the virtual console anymore. No, they are. They, they are still available. They were still up there the last time I checked on the Wii Virtual Console, which was like 
a couple of months ago. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. with licensed games like this, sometimes they get re-released and then you, you, like there's Ninja Turtle games and stuff that have gotten re-released and you can't get them anymore because the yeah the contracts only last so long. But these are, okay, so these are up on virtual consoles. So if you have a Nintendo Wii or Wii U, you can get them there. And then kind of shockingly, but really, it was really awesome, uh, Super Star Wars was released on the PS4 as well um, yeah. not too long ago. So... Yeah, That's and a, I believe it's uh, cross buy. So if you buy it on PlayStation Four, you'll also get it on Vita. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Um. So again, I mean, for a game like this to show up on PlayStation Four, uh, I think that is just really demonstrative of the fact that people really love this game and and want to see it come back because it's not necessarily the most natural fit for the PS Four. It's not. You no. wouldn't necessarily expect to find it there. So. But um, if you've never played it, you know, look forward to a pretty tough game, but really fun. And just, uh, again, I think it's so colorful and it's just, you know, it has like a really, uh, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but like, I feel like it has a really arcadey kind of feel to it. So to take Star Wars and and give it the the kind of arcade flair, um, I think it's really cool. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, fun games. All right, so that is Super Star Wars. Uh, Star Wars Pinball was also released in 1992, um, one of the first Star Wars pinball games. I don't know if I've ever played this one, to be honest. Um, this is from Data East, and uh, yeah. came out in 92. Have you played this one? Uh, no, I, I don't believe so. Okay. Um, um, I found a couple of really good video uh, sort of like walkthroughs of the game, people showing off their... their um, their pinball table for uh, Star Wars. So I'll try to link to those in the show notes and, uh, and maybe if you're, if you're interested, check it out. But um, yeah, it's got some really nice um, pinball table uh, art here and uh, some cool, fun Star Wars features. So this is, uh, this is one of a handful, at least of Star Wars pinball tables, but uh, a pretty cool one. There's, there's some bi- other big pinball tables, I think Star Wars uh, wise that come out in the nineties as well. So we'll, We'll talk about those too. Um, and then kind of rounding it out here for 1992, in terms of Star Wars home video, the Star Wars Trilogy Special Letterbox Collector's Edition uh, set was released as well. Um, and uh, Ryan, you linked in the show notes to a really cool post on StarWars.com from uh, one of my favorite bloggers and podcasters, which is Matt Dracula. Um, who runs the blog DinosaurDracula.com and uh, also does the fantastic, uh, always entertaining Purple Stuff podcast, uh, which started out as a Halloween-themed podcast, but now is, uh, is really just like a 80s, uh, 80s and 90s pop culture show. Uh, very, very fun. I would absolutely rec- recommend checking out the uh, Purple Stuff podcast. But um, yeah, we have this blog post on, on StarWars.com about the top five Star Wars home video releases, and um, this special letterbox, uh, letterbox Collector's Edition is featured there. Um, Ryan, I don't think you had this one, did you? No, this was not the version of the trilogy that um, that I had, but I really, really want this. <laughs> I was looking it up on eBay today. Um, yeah. If, you, if you're willing to settle for a slightly damaged uh, version, you could probably get it for about $30. Yeah. Um, it seems like a lot of times it's the box, you know, the, 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 cause what it is, is it's, uh, what the three films on VHS mm-hmm. in letterbox, which would be, I mean, I, 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 I don't remember seeing this around too much. And I feel like this would have been one of those kind of like Suncoast, uh, home video. You remember that store in the mall, Suncoast home oh, yeah. video? That seemed yeah. to be geared more towards like film buffs and film collectors and stuff like that. I remember going in and that, you know, they sold a lot of the like $70 videotapes and stuff, which if a movie didn't get a super wide release on VHS, you know, you could rent it, but buying it was oftentimes pretty expensive. Um, and anyways, I, it seems to me like this set was probably geared toward the the film buff and film collector kind of audience more so than like a major wide release thing. I don't know yeah. that for sure, but that's what it feels like. Oh yeah, definitely. Because I mean, to I mean, to even care about letterboxing, um, you know, that at that time was a very uh, specific type of fi- of like film fan. 
Yeah, yeah. But I mean, this package is super cool. It's like all three movies, Letterboxd, um, a a uh, a copy of From Star Wars to Jedi, The Making of a Saga, which was, I want to say like a PBS or something special about the... Uh, the special effects and the and the filmmaking process of the Star Wars trilogy, um, and that was originally re- it aired in eighty three. Yeah, yeah, I think it was part of the promotional campaign for Return of the Jedi, um, and that is available on the Blu Ray set for the Star Wars saga. Right, um, that's one of the special features I think that did make it to the Blu Ray set. So if you want to check that out, you can check it out there. Um, the, it also comes with, um, the George Lucas, the creative impulse book from Charles Champlin, although it says it is a special abridged version. So it's probably not, yeah, I believe book. it's a 48 page version. Okay. Book. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, um, there's that too. And, um, am I missing anything else that's part of this package? No. No, okay. I think it's uh, I think that's it. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, it's got a nice like hologram cover mm-hmm. on the on the box. Um, and you know, I I kind of just want this for like the the package and the collectability of it. But um, I think if uh, if I was going to buy a version of the Star Wars trilogy letterbox collector's edition, I'd probably maybe want the one that comes out next year in 93 um which is i believe the same thing but laser disc ah okay um you know i think i'll hold off on pulling the, you know maybe i'll just do like a like a brief like the briefest of teases mm. or maybe not actually maybe this is uh maybe we'll be looking at these down the road because oh, yeah. is this the version you're talking about the thx no no this is um the laser disc i believe the letterbox uh box set uh came out in laser disc as well in 93 and that's before i think the the thx were in 97 right yeah that sounds right it does sound right yeah i'm trying to look for the copyright back here and i'm not seeing it but um 90 yeah, Five. Oh, 95? Okay. Yeah. So cl- cover your eyes. Don't the look. Special at editions were 97. Okay. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah. So I'll put this away and we'll look at it <laughs> in in 95. But yeah, I do have that on Laserdisc and it's super cool. Um, that's something I want to do now is track down a Laserdisc player so I can actually watch those again at some point. Um, would be cool oh, to do. But I, those, I, think that was, uh, I still remember that. The I believe that was the first time you and I ever hung out was watching uh, Empire Strikes Back on Laserdisc at your old apartment. Oh, man. That was a very good first date. That's super cool. <laughs> yeah. Because um. <laughs> I think, yeah, we yeah. worked together and, and you were like, hey, I've got the Empire Strikes Back on Laserdisc. And <laughs> you want to come over and watch it? I was like, uh, yes. <laughs> want to come over and watch it? We'll uh, flip it three times during the during the viewing yeah. process four times <laughs> uh yeah so no, yeah, that's cool it was a good time yeah definitely um all right yeah i mean the 90s is full of uh cool star wars uh you know video releases so we'll be talking about those more too coming up on uh mm-hmm. on uh the power of the 90s so uh just one i think just one more thing to mention right before we wrap up the show yeah, uh, potentially, you know, depending on how you view this, maybe the most important event in Star Wars in 1992. Um, and that is the birth of Daisy Ridley and John Boyega, both born in 1992, according to your exhaustive research, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, I hope I got that right. I don't <laughs> even know where I pulled that information from, but it's definitely in our notes. So it must be true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's true. And that, that would put them at, what, 25 years old now? So. Yeah. Um, that seems about right, but, um, you know, star, I think, uh, hopefully after listening to the show or watching the show here, you feel like, uh, like 1992 gave us a lot of, uh, great gifts in terms of star Wars. And, uh, you know, I think both Daisy Ridley and John Boyega are, are, uh, incredible Perhaps and the greatest gifts. Well, you know, I was trying to avoid saying that, but, uh, They're sure. Al- I mean, that's among. true. They are, uh, <laughs> yeah, among. no, but I mean like they are galaxy treasures. Yeah, I mean, to me, without either of them, without um, both of them, 
you know, the, the new trilogy doesn't necessarily work. Uh, not to say that there aren't other yeah. great actors out there that could have possibly pulled it off, but um, yeah. you talk about like two of the most charismatic and just incredible actors. Um, I just, I can't, fa- it's like Harrison Ford, you know, can you, f- I can't fathom yeah. Han Solo if it's not Harrison Ford. Um, what well, that is? Well, uh, get ready to fathom that uh, <laughs> next year. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, but uh, I think you know what I mean, right? Like, if yeah. we've seen the audition tapes of other people um, auditioning oh, yeah. for for a Han Solo originally, and I just don't think it's possible that uh, the original trilogy um, has quite the same impact as it now does with somebody else playing the role of of uh, Han Solo, and I think. That's true. You know, to me, that's true for for Finn and for Ray. Um, both uh, Daisy Ridley and John Boyega are just unbelievable. So, yeah, great um, kids. Great kids. Yeah, very good news that they were born there in 1992 <laughs> when I was 10 years old and playing a bunch of Super Star Wars on the Super Nintendo. So, yeah. Uh, although I thought, honestly, I thought I was probably more than 10 years older than them. So when I saw that they were born in 92, I was like, oh, cool. I that's not that bad. Not that old. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Losing a lot of my hair and stuff, and I'm not that old, you know what I mean? I'm only 10 years older than them, so yeah, cool. All right, well, uh, this has been super, super fun, Ryan. I am loving going through um, the 90s and Star Wars uh, with you and on the show here, so uh, definitely excited to jump back in next month and look at a lot of uh, exciting stuff in 1993. Um, Before we do that, though, uh, Force Friday is coming up in 13 days, so oh my god, it's going to be really fun. And um, if there's no new Star Wars, uh, I'm sorry, if there's no new Blockade Runner podcast before then, uh, I think you can look forward to one uh, shortly after Force Friday. Um, so that'll be happening. And then, uh, like I said, uh, 1993 Power of the 90s coming up quickly after that. I still have my uh, my fingers crossed here for a Last Jedi trailer. Um, before that happens so we will see but in any case uh this has been power of the 90s for 1992 um we will be putting up um some supporting material for this show uh next week um as well so definitely subscribe to the youtube channel um and uh we'll we'll be putting up a video of um, empire strikes back on the nes and a video of um, super star wars on the uh, super nintendo maybe some other stuff as well. Um, you can check out the blog for any uh, posts we might do regarding um, the content uh, of this show and uh, other content. Ryan, we just started uh, a fun new uh, blog post series called uh, Blockade Runner Pickups, um, where we <laughs> we confess to how much money we spend on um, buying Star Wars stuff uh, each week, right? Yeah, it's uh, most of my paycheck. <laughs> um, uh, you you, uh, you you made me really nervous on Twitter the other day because you referred to it as a weekly feature, and I was like, ah, uh, weekly? Like, I'm gonna have to be, I'm gonna have to be, um, you know, buying a lot of stuff to keep up with it weekly. So I think sometimes it'll be weekly, though. Um, these last few weeks, it would probably be a weekly feature. Uh, yeah, and, no, uh, you absolutely buy at least one Star Wars thing every week. I probably do. Yeah, I've, I've got. You do. Um, <laughs> I, know, I know, I know, I know. So yeah, it, it'll probably be weekly, uh, a weekly feature, um, if not bi-weekly for sure. So um, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that. That's just fun. Um, no big deal. But you can check out the stuff we've been posting or the stuff we've been buying. Uh, on those posts. So blockaderunnerpodcast.com is where to check all of that out. Again, please subscribe on YouTube. Um, even if you don't watch the podcast there, we are putting up other uh, videos uh, fairly frequently. So I would I would uh, encourage you to, to subscribe on YouTube. Um, I'm going to say leave a review for the show on iTunes if you would. I uh, actually just went through and did that the other day for a few Star Wars podcasts that I have been listening to for a long time that I uh, shamefully had not left a review for. So um, it's a good feeling when you go on and, and share some some positive comments for for shows that you love. And uh, I just did that for a few shows that I that I really like. And um, you know, if you uh, if you're so inclined, it'd be great if you would leave us uh, a review on iTunes. What else am I missing? Uh, Instagram. You can check us out at the Blockade Runner on Instagram. I am on Twitter um, at Blockade Run for our Blockade Runner podcast account. And Ryan, your Twitter handle? 
is Braun Dwarf, B R A W N D W A R F. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us on our journey through uh, Star Wars in 1992. And uh, hope you'll be back with us for the power of the 90s covering Star Wars in 1993 next month. And until then, um, may the force be with you. Thank you.